we will now go ahead with dr sanjay agrawal stock on systemic control uh, and diabetic advent thank you very much can you see my screen yes yes great wonderful i'll just yeah all right so i would like to thank the vitro retinal society as well as all india ophthalmological society to collaborate with the uh, rssdi and i think this is such an important area that we need to cover and actually in the area of diabetes uh, discussions we tend to overlook this in a very big way so when you know dr raja and dr shobhit chawla approached dr bansi and me we were only very happy to take up this cause because it can probably lead to you know as much as possible prevention of blindness due to diabetes as a cause and uh, this workshop is going to go a long way to bridge the gap you know between the ophthalmologists the retinologists as well as the diabetologists to see how we can work effectively together to you know uh, bring the awareness of diabetes retinopathy as well as prevent you know blindness due to diabetes retinopathy so i'm just going to be very brief because the majority of this workshop should be actually trying to target uh, all about retinopathy but i was given the task to just highlight the fact that is systemic control of diabetes very important in prevention of retinopathy and that's my area that i'm really going to be talking about uh so diabetic retinopathy is a a uh, chronic progressive sight threatening disease and uh, retinal microvasculature uh, disease of the mi retinal microvasculature associated with prolonged hyperglycemia and other conditions linked to diabetes such as hypertension uh if you look at the prevalence almost about by the end of 2030 we're going to have more than 430 439 million people who are going to be suffering from diabetes and even if you take about 30% or 40% of these people in absolute numbers are going to have retinopathy at the end of it all that's a huge number of people that we are going to be looking at who's going to be suffering from diabetic eye disease now diabetes remains the leading cause of legal blindness between the ages of 25 to 65 years and this is from the western world and we just heard the statistics from india from dr padmaja so it is something that we should all be very concerned about and is responsible for almost about 1.8 million of the 37 million cause of blindness that are uh, present all across the world uh i'm just going to go back into history and this is where actually the retinopathy data comes from we were trying to see that what should be classified as an hpa1c value that should be said that okay is this patient a pre diabetic or a diabetic and this study comes from primarily from the pima indian study where they showed that at a uh, a1c of roughly between 6 to 6.5 the incidence of retinopathy uh, exponentially increases and this was also validated from studies from egypt and the enhanced study where they all showed that if they look at the fasting the 2r and the hba1c values there is a bimodal distribution when it comes to the fasting and 2r post meal on a oral glucose tolerance test where you see the you know the increase incidence of retinopathy when the fasting sugar is more than 100 and uh, when the post meal sugars are more than 200 but here the clearly you can see a sharp take off where the incidence of retinopathy takes off at about you know 6 to 6.5 and this is where actually we start talking about that you know what is the gold standard of normal uh, di differentiating between pre diabetes and diabetes so if you have to look at the 2 hour post meal glucose the fasting plasma glucose or the hba1c values we always talk about higher sensitivity and higher specificity so in a test with very high sensitivity negative rule uh, negative results rule out diagnosis but if the specificity is low there would also be many false positives and true positives will have to be identified by second more specific test which should be confirmatory and diagnostic so hence although we have data to show that uh, you know fasting glucose of more than 126 and a 2 hour glucose of more than 200 are cut off points for diagnosis of diabetes an associated diagnosis with hba1c of more than or equal to 6.5 acts as a confirmatory and that is why the ada finally decided that independently the a1c of more than 6.5 should be a criteria for diagnosis of diabetes so this is very important to understand that the entire data of normal to differentiate normal and abnormal diabetes has been based on the retinopathy data 
We have seen this flow diagram from Dr. Padmaja's talk that how hyperglycemia leads to diabetic retinopathy. So it affects the retinal blood flow. It causes a basement membrane thickening. The growth factors are increased. And all this leads to ultimately the vascular occlusion and vascular cell death lead, leading to retinal hypoxia, growth factors getting affected, and ultimately the retinal neovascularization. Now, these are some important facts that we should really be talking about in terms of you know, diabetic retinopathy. Remember that once one diabetic complication starts, complication begets complication. So once one complication is there, the second complication is just round the corner. So the duration of diabetes is one of the best predictors of diabetic retinopathy. In patients diagnosed of diabetes before the age of 30 years, the incidence of diabetic retinopathy after 10 years is almost 50%, and after 30 years is 90%. And after 20 years of diabetes, nearly 99% of the patients with type 1 and 60% with type 2 have some degree of diabetic retinopathy. This is because the progressive diabetic retinopathy is a result of very high average blood glucose levels that are more likely to be in type 1s than type 2s. But for some understood reasons, the incidence of maculopathy is more common in type 2s than type 1s. And diabetic retinopathy rarely develops within five years of onset of diabetes or before puberty, but about 5% of type 2s have diabetic retinopathy at presentation. So consequently, you can also understand that uh, tight glycemic control is responsible for reduction of the incidences of uh, microvascular complications. But the same doesn't hold true for macrovascular complications. The macrovascular complications is all about summing up redu reduction of the risk factors. So if you have high uh, hypertension or if you have diabetes or if you have dyslipidemia, obesity, so the reduction of all these risk factors ultimately re reduces the incidence of macrovascular complications. But there's a direct correlation between glycemic control and incidences of microvascular complications of which retinopathy is one of them. Uh, poor glycemic control, obviously, as, as a corollary, we know would cause a progression of the diabetic retinopathy. And I'm just going to allude to this a little while next. So there were two classic trials that have been always quoted in history. One is the DCCT trial, which is from the type 1 diabetic patients, and the UK PDS, which was studied in the type 2 diabetic population. And they randomized patients between conventional and intensive therapy. And what they showed was that the patients who were in the intensive group had a reduction of retinopathy by 54%, neuropathy by 60%, nephropathy by 54%, and macroalbuminuria by 39%. And the follow-up studies of the DCCT, the EDIC trial, they showed that there was a progressive reduction of retinopathy to the tune of 76%. And this was the, you can see that uh, there was, you know, the, there were two arms of the initial study. And when they were left alone and they were not followed up, the two arms merged together. But the benefit of good control in the initial years continued to exist even later on. And that is why it is important that in the early stages of diabetes, good control gives a legacy effect of good effect even at the later years of life. So if you look at this data which came out from the retinopathy, you can see in the primary prevention at the end of the follow-up studies, there was almost 76% of relative risk reduction. In the seven, secondary prevention, there was almost 54% risk reduction of retinopathy with good glycemic control. The same is true also in the UK PDS study, which was done in type 2 diabetic patients. And here again, there was randomization between conventional and the intensive groups. And you can clearly see here that good glycemic control in the intensive arm relate, uh, caused any diabetes-related endpoint to reduce by 12%, microvascular disease by 25%, myocardial infarction by 16%, and all-cause mortality by 6%. And if you look at the follow-up study of the UK PDS, you find that this benefit of good glycemic control in the initial years continues to exist even when they were unmonitored. And you can see here, that the, any diabetic-related endpoint continued to be at a lower incidence by 9%, microvascular disease by 24%, myocardial infarction by 15%, and all-cause mortality by 13%. So this was really the crux of talking point that 
all patients, when they come to us with early diagnosis and you know, we detect them early, there's always got to be a clear emphasis on how patients can be controlled to the best possible glycemic control. The other thing that we should always keep in mind is pregnancy. And some, uh, sometimes associated when you have you know, existing diabetic retinopathy in patients who are getting pregnant. So patients who are pre-pregnancy di diabetes and have retinopathy and they tend to become pregnant. Sometimes greater pre-pregnancy can, I mean, pre with a pre-pregnancy retinopathy, you can get a uh, worsening of the retinopathy during the course of pregnancy. And especially if you exert control too rapidly during the early stages of pregnancy. And this possibly can be because of development of preeclampsia or fluid imbalance that they all can contribute to the worsening of the retinopathy during the pregnancy. Again, there is a close relationship between diabetes, hypertension, and retinopathy. And this is some of the classic landmark trials. The ABCD trial, which targeted the blood pressure to be between 140 to 80. And what they showed was tight control appears to particularly benefit type 2 diabetics with maculopathy. The Euclid trial, which showed lower rates of development of retinopathy in diabetics taking lisinopril for antihypertensive medications as compared to placebo. We all know that if patients have diabetic nephropathy, they usually tend to have an associated retinopathy. So you have always got to be screening for retinopathy in presence of diabetic kidney disease. And they have shown that treatment of renal disease with ACRBs may be associated with improvement of retinopathy. So if I have to just sum that up as a risk factor where hypertension is con uh, concerned, it's very common in patients with type 2 diabetes, we should aim for a strict control. Where nephropathy is concerned, it's associated with worsening of the diabetic retinopathy. There is some data to show that renal transplantation may be associated with improvement of the diabetic retinopathy, and there's a better response to photocoagulation. So the other risk factors that we tend to overlook is obesity, hyperlipidemia, and anemia. So these are some things that we should never overlook. So if I have to really put it in a nutshell, the other risk factors, smoking, the gender ratio, hyperlipidemia, obesity, anemia, and carotid artery occlusive disease, alcohol, all these are sort of concomitant risk factors that should never be ignored in patients with diabetes because ultimately all these are uh, sort of need us for developing any of the diabetic complications in future. So to sum it up, this is my last slide, that health, education, diet, and control remain the hallmark for prevention of diabetic retinopathy. We have seen with various studies that improved glucose control and blood pressure control reduces the risk of diabetic eye disease by one-fourth. It reduces the risk of severe visual impairment by more than half, the kidney damage by one-third, and stroke by one third. So I'll stop here and thank you very much for your patient listening. And I would like to compliment both the societies to associate again with the RSSDI. And we look forward to work in collaboration with all of you to see how effectively can we make this change across the country. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sanjay Agrawal. Actually, uh, we have lots of questions probably. Uh, but I will start with Dr. Banshi Sabo, actually. Uh, sir, you had mentioned in your initial introduction some specific requirements from the physicians and diabetologists' side as to what you expect from us. Now, uh, I think Dr. Rajiv Raman will be covering on the uh, guideline patterns and you know what are the different uh, investigations that are cost-effective. But uh, other than that, related to Dr. Sanjay Agarwal's talk, when a patient of diabetic retinopathy comes to us as retina specialists, we tell them, you know, control your sugar, you know, we just say systemic control. But I would like to know what kind of a communication pattern would you expect uh, as a diabetologist from a retina specialist? And is there anything specific that you would look out for from a retina specialist so that you can take care of the overall systemic control of the patient? Should I answer for that? Uh, yes. yes. I think the reinforcement of all the education which is done by a diabetologist or a physician, you know, just telling them, can you please keep your good glucose control is, I think, insufficient statement. It requires the complete metabolic control. Most of the time, I had seen 
even my colleagues who are retina specialists and ophthalmologists they will check the retina and they will just tell that you you need a good glucose control but i think if they can spare maybe 1 minute more or 2 minutes more to see that what about the lipids what is the renal function what medication patient is going on what are the previous reports of lipids and hb1c and you are just reinforcing the same education which a physician is also doing that you please get all these things to be controlled you know sometimes what happens the patient might be getting the treatment from a primary care physician and you are just saying that go to your physician the difference between a physician and a diabetologist is the same if it difference between a ophthalmologist and a retina specialist i am sure i think this one should be uh, one ophthalmologist should appreciate the same i mean just to tell him that you go to your primary care physician and get all these thing control i don't think it is so easy if it is so easy then why he should have uh, you know develop all those complications of diabetes i mean we must tell him that you know it requires a very good glycemic control without any glycemic variability last time you have 120 but before that you were having 220 your self monitoring is not done you are not having a good control of a1c your lipids are not well controlled your blood pressure is not getting good control and one more thing important thing is i am seeing in india we are having a lot of patients who are on pioglitazone and macular edema is one of the complication yes which is most of the time i mean a ophthalmologist or a retina specialist is not putting any remark on it and patient continues it because the physicians uh, are just forgetting that a macular edema could be a relative contraindication of use of this rather i will request sanjay as well as the ophthalmic society as well as retina we can come out with a very good paper that what is the incidence those patients who are uh, of 5 years or 10 years of diabetes we can have a cut off and then how many patients on on more than 5 years of pioglitazone and without pioglitazone and what is the incidence of diabetic retinopathy and out of that diabetic retinopathy how many of them have macular edema and then after stoppage of pioglitazone after how many weeks to how many months can it be reversed also so something which we can do nationally also so these are some of the important points i think if ophthalmologist also reinforces the education part of it i think and then you can tell specifically like the way we are telling that you know this patient requires a specific retina specialist opinion not just ophthalmologist the similar way i think a ophthalmologist or a a retina specialist must tell their patient if they are not having a good control go to a diabetes specialist to have a good control of diabetes yeah i think you have made excellent points dr sabu actually in this workshop while we have been kind of focusing that the diabetologist and physician have to spare more time and talk about retinopathy or referral guidelines for them to us there is a reverse learning also which has to happen that is as ophthalmologists and retina specialists we also need to learn and actually counsel the patients for two more minutes as dr sabu has said and reinforce about their not just glucose level but even the other factors like lipid control or hypertension or nephropathy all those things will take additional 2 minutes so while we are asking the diabetologist and physician to give 2 minutes for fundus we should also spend 2 more minutes to talk about non retinopathy and reinforce their overall control and i See, what happens when patient goes to any specialist like suppose my patient who goes to a cardiologist or a nephrologist who had already developed the complication then that is specialist because that is now the primary problem he is understanding that diabetes is a primary problem but now this is a major issue if the same specialist also talk about the importance of a good glycemic control it makes lot of difference you know if a ophthalmologist or a retina specialist again tells it is all because of your poor glycemic control and still it will further worsen if you will not keep a very good or tight glycemic control we know from science point of view that initially for a shorter period of time if we in, increase the tighter glycemic control probably it may worsen the retinopathy but only for a short period of time but for a long period of time these patients will ultimately get benefit at least for further complication which are there like retinopathy along with retinopathy nephropathy and other complication they all can be prevented or at least the progression can be halted so i mean 
what i mean to say ki the specialist who is dealing with these complication they also must reinforce the patient about the importance of a tighter glycemic control they should also know what is a1c what should be the a1c every time when patient goes in next 6 months there is a visit or next 3 months you have a follow up visit with the patients you please see that what is your a1c when it was done why you are not gone to your doctor why you are coming only here now the patient is just going on keeps on going to a ophthalmologist or a retina specialist of last two years or one and a half years for getting his treatment but he is completely forgotten his primary care physician or a diabetologist he had not gone there he had not seen his a1c report so that should not happen i think that is very very important from uh, a consulting point of view from ophthalmolog ophthalmic side very nice point dr sabu so like you have already made the differentiation in the sense uh, of ophthalmologist versus retina specialist do you recommend a similar guideline let us say if a retina specialist has found diabetic retinopathy that means already microvascular complications have started and that patient is actually going to a primary care physician maybe once in 6 months they don't know what's happening is there a point where we need as retina specialist to now funnel these patients to a diabetologist should they no rajya this is not possible because in india the number of diabetic patients are so high and primarily we want all primary care physician to treat diabetic patients but i will specifically say only for those patients who have developed some complications and now they require more tighter glycemic control because still initiation of insulin done in india by only 4000 or 5000 physicians and around 20000 physicians might be prescribing it as a follow up patients but you know we have 100000 physicians in india who are treating or primarily they are writing so type 2 diabetic patients are so number is so large even 50% of them are not getting treatment at this point of time as per in dab study so what i will recommend from rss day that all my primary care physician should be trained enough to write and prescribe the treatment and they should follow and that is what our rssdi guideline we had now gone to all districts of country all rural physician started using our rssdi guideline to treat the diabetic patients but our primary idea is at least they should also know when they should refer to specific diabetes specialty clinic so as a doctor as a ophthalmologist or as a retina specialist doctor at least you can tell that your diabetes require better control a good glycemic control will help you if your doctor who is doing a diabetes practice also is good enough but otherwise you can think of taking uh, a consultation or a uh, you know a, a one visit to a diabetes specialist doctor also for a better glycemic control but primarily on a as a blanket statement i don't want to make that each and every patient of diabetic should go to a diabetes specialist only what do you say sanjay you know i entirely agree with you because the wide population of people that we have it today uh it's it's physically impossible that you know everybody can touch base with a, uh, a you know specialized diabetologist uh they have to and it's i mean majority of the work is done by the primary care physicians but you have to funnel them into a space and they develop complications so that they can better manage and uh, i think that's where dr bansi is coming from to say that if you do find that there are early you know indications of complications then you need to involve a tertiary care center who would handle the complications well who are trained to do so so that you know we can pre- slow down the complications or reverse the complications and not end up having you know advanced eye disease which can lead to blindness at a later point of time so i think our responsibility goes to all the patients with diabetes to see how effective treatment that we can give them so while you know giving them good glycemic control is been at the primary care physician level getting them to better goals and or complicated cases which are not achieving the goals and you know looking at complications probably may require a little more specialized help and that's where probably you need to make that differentiation yeah i think that those are excellent points that uh, have come out in fact just looking at this discussion i feel that maybe you know we should come out with a paper at least the initial draft of what should be the guidelines the communication pattern the referral patterns uh, you know between diabetologists physicians and ophthalmologists uh, yeah, just to give you a reference raja that you know 
uh, what is happening is we are focusing so much from our specialized areas. For example, we talk about diabetes and hypertension and diabetes and lipids. There are so many other aspects that we have not. And recently, we actually combined with the periodontal society to lay stress on diabetes and oral health. And we have come out and published a paper together with the Indian Periodontal Society uh, on diabetes and oral health. And that has really gone all over the place, where experts from both the societies actually got together and how can we train dentists about oral health. And uh, that has made a huge impact. And we are sort of rolling it out as a workshop too. Similarly, I think, you know, our societies, uh, vitreoretinal and ophthalmic and RSSDI, can come up with, you know, uh, points for both the sides, for the ophthalmologists as well as for uh, you know primary care and diabetologists, how collaboratively we can work together to reduce the incidence of diabetic risk. Yeah, thank you so much. Actually, both uh, Dr. Rajiv Raman and Dr. Padmaja Rani are experts, and they would you know they would be act actually very keen to work on this kind of a paper and come up with common guidelines. So actually, I, I can assure you that they both will do a, definitely a good job and uh, come back to us with uh, guidelines.